very much for the invitation and sorry for those who already seen this uh, talk many times, probably a long time ago or so. So hopefully they will have forgotten a little bit, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so I'm going to introduce um, um, a course invariant that we introduced uh, a few years ago, uh, maybe now it's uh, five years ago, uh, with uh, Goryang Yu and uh, Eric Gettner in order to prove the theorem I'm going to state first. So let me write the theorem that was our main motivation. So let M and N be a spherical closed manifold of high enough dimension. Well, for one of the statements, this is not required, but anyway. Um, such that phi 1 of M has a faithful representation, by which I mean finite dimensional representation. Then the following holds. So we have two statements. One is about the large scale geometry of the universal cover. So, okay, so the, the we can assume that they are Riemannian if you feel better about it. Otherwise, we can just, okay, otherwise you can just take, um, I mean, the following statement would make sense anyway, but if you are more comfortable with Riemannian, it's fine. So, assume that there is a quasi asymmetry between the universal cover. then phi is at bounded distance from a homeomorphism. That's the so-called bounded Borel conjecture. And second, assume theta is a homotopy equivalence this time between the compact manifolds. Then, if you take theta cross the identity between m cross r3 and n cross r3, this is homotopic to a homomorphism. So this is a stable Borel conjecture, which is of course a, a weak state. I didn't say that. I say that the group has a faithful representation. That was the mo the motivation was really to prove this theorem. So these statements were known for manifolds with a group having finite asymptotic dimension, um, which was a no, it was a theorem of Chang, Farrell, um, Chang, um, uh, Farrell, and you. For, for in the case of uh, finite asymptotic dimension. So the point was that we didn't have finite asymptotic dimension for, for linear groups. And we, were we, start we, we started actually thinking about, you know, trying to understand which linear groups have finite asymptotic dimension. And we tried to prove first that all the, the linear groups which happen as the pi 1 of a closed spherical manifold have finite asymptotic dimension, which is probably true, actually. We don't know. But we couldn't prove it. And instead of that, we ended up um, cooking some, some new uh, course invariants that was supposed to be much more flexible than finite asymptotic dimension, which I'm going to introduce also, by the way. Sorry, did you say? What did you say? No, no, what I said is that maybe if, if, you, know if you know that it has a faithful inter uh, representation, uh, it may be true that it has finite asymptotic dimension. This we don't know, and it's very likely to be true, but we couldn't, prov we couldn't prove it. So instead of that, we just cook up this notion of FTT, which I'm going to find soon, and which was supposed to do the job. So the job was what? So the job actually was to prove some isomorphism uh, uh, conjecture, or con uh, I mean assembly map, um, 
at, uh, at the coarse level, namely uh, the bounded Borel level. And what we needed, the main tool that was at, at our disposal, was some kind of Meyer Vietoris, large scale Meyer Vietoris sequence proven by uh, Yamasaki and, and, uh, and Raninsky. And so we needed to, to fill this machinery with some kind of nice property of the space, large scale property of the space, that would ena enable us to, uh, to apply this Meyer Vietoris. So when you have Meyer Vietoris sequence, what you need to do is you need to cut, cut your space into two pieces and try to understand the two pieces and think that and hope that it would be better than the, the space you started with. So that's really the base, the basic thing. So before I'm moving to the to the definition, so the second part, let me be a little more uh, comprehensive about uh, the application that we have. So the applications are the following ones. So assume that of FTC. Uh, assume that I'm going to say something which I've not defined yet, but it should not be a problem. So assume that gamma has finite uh, k pi 1 and FTC, then, so what we proved was uh, that the Novikov, the integral conjecture in M theory more well satisfied for gamma. We proved and this is a result in algebraic K theory. We proved that with uh, so this is a result. So this one is uh, is due to Gettner U in in eleven. But in K theory, the algebraic K theory version is due to um, to Dan in 2012, and uh, there is also the bounded Borel conjecture. I should say I won't write it. So okay, so these are our main applications. So what you have to think about is that these are injectivity uh, statements. So we don't we cannot prove subjectivity with these kind of methods. Okay. And they are really based uh, uh, on, on these ideas which, which uh, I mean, on ideas which are kind of coming from Gaudian's proof of the coarse Bumpton conjecture, which also apply more or less in his theory to this setting. Okay, so I'm done with the application. Now I'm going to define FTC. So before I define it formally, let me tell you that the inspiration came again from finite asymptotic dimension. So let me start with finite asymptotic dimension. So this is a notion that, that was introduced by Gromov in the 80s. And it is the following. Suppose X is a metric space. Then it has, so definition. has asymptotic dimension less or equal than n if x can be uh, written as a union of uh, n plus 1 subsets such that each, each, each one of them is an, ah, sorry, for every r positive, uh, such that each one of them is an r disjoint union of subthings with the diameter is uniformly bounded like this. Okay? So let me give you an example. So what does it mean, for instance, to be one dimensional? So let the case of Z or case of R. So the case of R, R is a one-dimensional object which can be seen as follows. So how do you decompose R? You need two pieces in order to prove dimension one. So you are going to just decompose it as intervals of length, let's say, to R, to be, on the, to be safe. That will 
So what you have is really that uh, X here is the union of X1 and then X2 and clearly X1 and X2 are union which are R disjoint R disjoint meaning of course that they are at, at distance at this R R disjoint copies of intervals of length um, of length um, uh, to R, so bounded, uniformly bounded. Okay, and same for the blue part of it. Okay, so the idea behind um, FTC is to stop at dimension one, not try to go further away. I mean, that originally we had a version with which was called weak FTC, which was involving uh, iterating actually this uh, definition precisely, but it was not enough somehow for our purposes. So we have to give it to, to give up. So, but for my of theories anyway, what we need is actually a decomposition into two pieces. Uh, so it's natural to try to iterate this notion of being of dimension one, and that's what we did. So the idea behind FTC is to iterate this in the following way. So before introducing, so FTC is iterative uh, well yeah, version of dimension as as dimension. Okay, so it's actually easier when you want to iterate this thing to directly work not with a single space but with a family of spaces. Why? Because if you want to iterate, it means that instead of requiring that the bound that the pieces that we get in the end are uniformly bounded. What you want is to really compose them again. So it's better to introduce already in order to, 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 um, to avoid having to, to talk about uniformity and stuff like that, to work directly in terms of, of a family of metric spaces. So what, what could be called a metric family, family. It's just a set of, it's just a set. So we'll denote it like that. of metric spaces, which generally will turn out to be subsets of a given metric space, but not necessarily. So this, is this will be for us what, what's a metric family. Then we'll have to use a notion of decomposition, which is already uh, here, at least but in, in the one-dimensional case. So we'll say that a metric family R decomposes, which we denote by that, into another metric family. So if for every uh, X in the family and for every R, actually, actually yeah, for every R, uh, there exists, uh, I mean, X can be decomposed into X0 union X1 with uh, each Xi to being the R disjoint union of xij and what we what we ask is that the family of all xijs is a subset of the family y okay so being of dimension 1 precisely mean that if you start with your metric space it decomposes into a family which is uni which is bounded so what does it mean for a family to be bounded so X is called bounded simply if the diameter, the supremum, yes, can you can you repeat that? Sorry, I and J are running both. And X. You're right. Sorry about that. Thanks. The three index, uh, the three indices are running. The whole, fa whole collection of all this is it has to be uniform. So the, the uniformity is encoded by the fact indeed that we have the three indexes, which are running. I guess at this point, thank you for this remark. It's actually crucial. So yeah. 
There shouldn't be a problem now. <laughs> they are subset, but you forget about that. You just take them as a collection. Uh, you, you forget about the fact that they are subsets of a given set. For you, they are metric spaces within this system. It's a just a collection. It's just a way, it's, it's, a, it's a convenient way of, of, of saying that everything is uniform in here. Uh, you just mention a property for the whole collection. So, and same thing for being bounded. Being bounded just means that the supremum over all the diameters of the, of the spaces uh, is finite. Excuse me? Wha wha where? Excuse me, it's a family which, it's a subfamily of the collection of spaces. Of course, they are all up to isometry. Uh. What if I say what? It precisely means that all these sets are actually bounded. Yes. Yeah. But here it's only a, a metric family. So you have a metric, so you start with X. You decompose it, so you, take you start with X, which is a metric family. You take every metric space there, you decompose it, you get a bunch of subspaces, which you just take as a family of spaces. And then you take all the collection of all the subspaces that you got uh, doing decomposing all these metric spaces in this metric family. It gives you a new metric family. What you require is that this metric family is contained in the second one. It's a sub-metric family of the second one. Okay. That's I, I agree it's a little bit loose in terms of In terms of set theory, <laughs> it's not perfectly. Uh, okay. But the idea should be clear, I hope. Okay, so now there are various ways of in, in introducing and de defining the property. No, oh, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Thank you, thank you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for following. Very close. <laughs> it's good. It means that you are really uh, following closely what I'm saying. So, Okay, so let me, before even like defining formally, let me illustrate the fact that uh, we can iterate the procedure for Z2, okay, for R2. Okay. So what can we do for R2? For R2, we can, first, we can decompose it a little bit like what I did for, for R. So you take a first, a first decomposition is like that. Etc. Etc. Okay. So first of all, you get like R2, which is your X. R decomposes over a family of things which are all isometric. So it's a family of things like that. They are all essentially um, like coarsely equivalent to R. Okay, uniformly. So then I can apply. Uh, then I can apply my f the other. Uh Decomposition, which is this one. I can decompose it like that. Even if I get a fresh R, so let's say that this is R0. Now suppose I, I pick a new R1. Then I can decompose it like that. and so on. And when what am I left with? So in the end, so this means that these things here are one decomposes over a collection of rectangles. 
where the this one is two R zero and this one is two R one. Okay? So of course these are bounded sets, bounded metric spaces. Okay, so this time in two steps, I'm uh, ending up with um, with bounded things. And what you can see from this thing is from this um, procedure is that I can pick R zero and then I can be given any R one, even completely independent I mean doesn't have to depend on what I've done before, I can still produce this thing. So now the right way to, to formalize this is not exactly as one may, th may think at first as an algorithm, but as a game. Because you'd like to be able to do things, you know, given a fresh R1, and independently, completely of what you've done before, you'd like to be able to continue and end up with bounded pieces in the end. So maybe not after two steps, maybe after three steps, maybe after um, a number of steps which is not known in advance, but you'd like that in, the, uh, in, a, in a finite number of steps, you end up with bounded pieces. So that's the idea behind FTC. So let me introduce the decomposition game. So I'm going to, since this is the, I don't know how many times <laughs> I've given this talk, I feel like I need to, to introduce a little bit of novelty. So that it will not be the good, the good guy and the bad guy as I do usually, it will be like the wizard. and the little girl. Okay? So, so the little girl is uh, playing against the wizard. So the little girl is very naive, so she just gives big numbers, you know, like she gives so the, the game starts with the data of a, of a metric space. So we have a metric space which is given to us. Okay. So the start starting point is our metric space, or if you want, our metric family. If you want to. Okay. So this is we denoted by x zero because it is our first starting point. So then the first step of the game first step of the game is uh, the little girl giving us a first number, R0. She thinks it's a very big number. She thinks she, she's going to win, like the other one. The wizard will not be able to provide the decomposition. But the wizard is clever. So he gives you back a new family, X1. If it's really good, x1 is already bounded, so then the game stops. But if it's not the case, the little girl gives a new number, r1, which is even bigger. So she thinks this time it, won't be, it will be impossible for the wizard to win. So then the wizard comes back with a new family, this time with the number r1, and so on. And what the point is that either the wizard wins after a certain number of steps, which means that he produces a bounded family. So he can win at steps 1, 2, 3, 4, n. Maybe we don't know in advance. Maybe it depends on what the little girl will, will I mean, all of the, n the numbers that the little girl will, um, will, uh, will give him. Will give him and so this is or or he or the game never stays never stops and then yeah <laughs> and the little girl yeah but this is a trick this is the trick so she you always win because the the wizard always win because the little girl will stop at some point so so the game never never stops okay so you probably guess that 
definition x has FTC if the weather has a winning strategy. Okay, so this may sound a little bit abstract to you, but it's actually a very convenient way of defining, defining the property and proving it for many, uh, for many examples. Uh, let me do it for, uh, by the way, that's a proposition, it's actually a theorem. Um, one can prove that x has finite asymptotic dimension if and only if the wizard has a winning strategy. Excuse me? It's allowed. It's perfectly allowed. She can really give any, any numbers, but of course it's becoming more and more difficult. The numbers are big. So the wizard give, uh, has a winning strategy in n steps. Which I'm not saying that n is, give is the dimension. It's actually, we don't know exactly. We don't have uh, such a sharp estimate. But we know that n is um, at most 2 to the, two to the dimension. Okay, but the point is that n is given, so it, does it does depends only on the space. It does not depend on the game, on the precise game. Okay, so and of course, what what is easy to check is that for uh, R d or Z d, uh, the number of steps which is required is d. Uh, we already did the case of d equals two, so d steps, which of course means uh, that the space has finite symmetric dimension, which is not really new. Okay. But then there is also the following example, which is the first example which doesn't have an asymptotic dimension. It's good to see it right away. So the first example which doesn't have an asymptotic dimension is the following group. You take direct sum infinite copies of direct of uh, uh, an infinite direct sum of copies of z of z, and you just put a norm which is invariant, and the norm is. Just the following one. Take the sum, the weighted sum, n times a n, sorry, absolute value. The point of this norm is that it, is it, gives, it gives you a proper invariant matrix. Proper means that the balls are finite. Okay? So let me um, prove. So the fact is that because it contains z to the d for every d, uh, it does not have finite asymptotic dimension. But so it has infinite dimension. But it has FTC. So let me run the game for you, in this case. Excuse me? It's not an algorithm. It's, it's a little bit different, because an algorithm um, would mean somehow, I mean, an algorithm would mean like a sit, um, that you feed uh, the game, uh, you feed somehow the, the procedure originally with the sequence, which can be arbitrary. But here it's a little bit different because you don't want to have the sequence in advance. You don't want to do something with where you could use the information of the whole sequence in advance. Here you don't know uh, in advance the information about the whole sequence. Every time you've done something, the only thing you know is that you have what you've done already and you are given this fresh number and you have to adapt to it. So it's not exactly the same. It's not formally the same. It's a bit stronger, actually. And this is somehow what was required for our proof. So let me do it for the infinite copies of direct sum of z. So maybe let me do it here.
So let's be given this R0. What can we do with R0? Well, with R0, what we want is we want a decomposition of x0 as a union of two things. Okay? So what we'll, go wha what we'll do is the following thing. We look at the ball of values R0. In, uh, in G. This ball of values R0 is finite. It contains a certain number of elements. So it generates is isomorphic to Z to the I think it's I don't remember exactly what it is but I if I'm not wrong it's uh, R0. Something like that. But in any case, it's a—I mean—it's a subgroup of this infinite direct sum. But it's a there are only finitely summons, finitely many summons, okay? And on the other hand, if you think of this, um, so this is a subgroup which I'm going to call G R zero. What you have is that the cosets, the different cosets, left or right cosets, it's an abelian group, of G to the R zero are at distance R zero apart, okay? The distance between G R zero and anything which is not like a, a left coset X plus G R zero is at most R zero. Why is it the case? Because what is the the R zero neighborhood of a coset? The R zero neighborhood of a coset is just the coset multiplied on the right, or here it's an addition by the ball of radius R zero. But the ball of radius R zero is contained in the group because it generates the subgroup. So it is completely so the it means that the R zero neighborhood of any coset is actually the coset itself. Okay? So it means that all these left cosets are R zero disjoint. So what what what's given by our uh, result at scale at step one is X one, which are the left cosets of G R zero. But these are all isometric to z to the r zero. Okay, so from there we know how to decompose them. Okay, so then we know that only r zero steps are required to conclude. To So there is nothing the girl can do from this point because now I mean she she knows that she's screwed. I mean after R zero step, of course if she thinks that the wizard is uh, already old and that he's got only uh, a few years to live, then she can uh, she can put a very very large R zero, and then the wizard will die before, her. so she will win fr from this uh, from this situation. But you know the point is that there is no bound in advance. It completely depends on the first R zero she picks. So somehow this is not very good news for the wizard. Okay, so now let me give a different Don't hesitate to interrupt me if there is a another imprecision or something which doesn't seem to make sense. So, yeah, so... Let me define D0 to be the set of matrix of bounded matrix families. Okay. So this time D zero is a collection of sets, a collection of matrix families. Sorry. So it's a collection of collections. It's a collection of matrix families. So every uh, element of D zero is a bounded uh, matrix family, but of course each matrix family has its own diameter. So the diameter is not a priori bounded for elements of D0. Then we can define 
by induction for every ordinal alpha, we can define the alpha to be the following thing. It's uh, the set, let's not be too picky about that, of metric families such that for each R, there exists an ordinal which is less than alpha, such that and y, which belongs to d beta, such that x r decomposes over y. So this is a little bit in digest, so that's why I'm going to pause for a few seconds. So, I mean, this is not the only way you can define an ordinal. You could also take a different definition, whether the ordinal is a limit ordinal or... Uh, but it doesn't matter. This is one possibility, so uh, let me stick with this one. This is the one that we have in our paper. The point being that, this is a proposition, not very hard, um, a metric family has FTC if and only if it belongs to some D alpha for some uh, countable alpha. You don't have to... Uh, to assume that it is countable, you can always make it countable. So let me uh, sketch the, the idea be behind the proof. So it is not hard to see that if you have FTC in the sense I described already, uh, or the other way around, excuse me, uh, one direction is actually obvious, I don't remember which one, I may let you think about it. So, no, so the direction which is kind of clear is that if you belong to some D alpha, uh, then, um, then you are, uh, then you are, um, uh, you are, you, you are, uh, sorry, you have FTC. The reason being that this is just the definition of ordinal, okay? If you start going backward in the ordinal things, you, start you have to stop at some point. So, um, what I'm going to prove is that I'm going to explain the proof of the fact that if X has FTC, then it belongs to the alpha. So how do you do that? Well, you have to uh, draw what's called the decomposition tree. So what you do is the following thing. You're going to describe the fact that you have a winning strategy in terms of a, of a tree. So you start, so your tree is a, um, is a rooted tree and each vertex is um, colored by a, fa a metric family. So the, the origin is colored by X0, which is your first metric space. Then for every edge, you put an integer, for instance. It doesn't have to be an integer, but let's put integers. So you have one, two, three, four, etc., five. And for every, uh, for everything, and here what you have, what you see, the all the edges, all the the vertices which are um, um, children of X naught, are supposed to be metric families, candidates for X one, and precisely. For each number, these are supposed to be a metric family corresponding to the number that was given by the little girl. So either one, two, three, four. So we just pick integers because the point is that if you have a metric family that works for a number, it also works for the smaller numbers. So you may as well consider that they are only integers. So what you get, like that, is this root of three, and so on. You have x two x3 and so on. So what, what's the point? The point is that this tree has no infinite ray if it corresponds to a winning strategy. Why is it called a strategy? 
It's a strategy because this is what the wizard will have to do. It, it, it gives you exactly what the wizard is supposed to do, given any situation. Okay? So suppose he's here, so first he has x0, and suppose the girl says five. Okay, then he says, oh, I'm going to give this x1 here. Suppose that then the little girl says 100. Ah, okay, so then I'm going to say this one, and so on and so on. So and the point is that having no infinite ray precisely means that whenever you're, you're going down, you have to stop at some point, which means that there is a winning strategy and that this tree corresponds to a winning strategy. So now let me uh, tell you how you associate a, um, um, Sorry. We'll talk if you want about it uh, after. But it's not no, it's not exactly equal. It's not the same. Maybe you could. I don't know. Maybe m it depends on how. Well, it, it you're right. It depends maybe on what you mean by yes. If you want, yes, you can. Uh, you can always encode it. It's it's an algorithm with with an infinite memory. Maybe if you want or something like that. I don't know. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. But in this sense, if you want, it's an algorithm. I mean, you can maybe reinterpret it as an as an algorithm. Indeed, I kind of like the I kind of like the um, uh, the game theoretic approach. But you're right that if you allow yourself maybe uh, an infinite memory, then maybe you can you can you can. Uh, but, but somehow, an algorithm, you'd like to think that you need. Finite data somehow to make your choice every time. So that's why I don't like to call it an algorithm. Anyway, so yes, so what I wanted to say is that, okay, you have your tree. Now the fact is that, so there exists a map from the vertex set of this tree which associates. An, an ordinal, okay, and this ordinal satisfies the following thing, such that you have that for every leaf of the tree. Oh, this tree has a lot of leaves because it doesn't have uh, infinite an infinite ray. So for every leaf alpha v equals zero. So if v is a leaf. And it satisfies the fact that um, alpha v is the supremum of over all um, vertices which are, I'm going to explain what it means, uh, below v of alpha w plus one. So that's the right choice that implies that the final um, thing would coincide with what we want. So again, so let me explain. So what it is, is you, de you define it inductively if you want. So for a leaf, you say it's it equals zero. Then when you are a vertex, you define it by saying that it has to be the supremum over all vertices which are below it in the tree of the ordinals that you have for this uh, for these, uh, for these um, uh, vertices which are below, so plus one, that's why plus one. So that's the definition, and then the point is that you can check that because the tree has countably uh, countable uh, set of vertices, then alpha v will be uh, will be countable. And also, the point of all this is that x belongs to d alpha um, v zero where v0 is the root. Okay. So clearly this is the, sp the, the, sp the largest possible ordinal that you can get for a vertex because it's above all the other ones. Okay. And the point being that, well, this gives you precisely uh, the conclusion of the, of the proposition. Okay. Uh, if you think about it, it's completely uh, coherent with the, uh, with the, um, um, the inductive um, Definition of the alpha that I that I written here. Okay, so this is not a 
an exact proof, but you can very easily check the details. Now, I can reformulate a few things. Z to the D, or Z, Z to the N, belongs actually to DN, okay, or R to the N, doesn't matter. Um, the infinite copy, infinite direct sum of copies of D belongs to D omega, but not in to D n, so it's really uh, exactly in D omega. But apart from that, we don't know a single example of something which lives in D omega and or lives which has finite static dimension and does not live in D omega. So find an example of um, matrix space, or maybe a group, but even better if it's a group, finitely generated group, of course, the general matrix, which belongs to uh, D uh, something, let's say which D alpha or some alpha, but not in D omega, which is not known. It's one of the few questions that nobody uh, was able to solve. Okay, so yeah, so maybe I'm going now to move to permanence properties. Okay. No, no, I don't know even for metric spaces. I know, any, I mean. I say group because somehow this is a natural, uh, a natural, um, um, I mean, a framework wha where we can construct objects which have interesting. Uh, I mean, I can give you an explicit example, uh, for instance. Um, oh, I'm going to give it a bit later after I explain the permanence property. Okay, so parent properties. So the point of this uh, of this uh, notion is that it's extremely flexible. So it's the first thing which is obvious is that it is stable by taking subspaces. Okay, if you can decompose a space, then you can decompose a, sub a subspace. And actually, even if you take the collec a collection of, subspa of, uh, of subspaces of a given space, it also has the decomposition problem, if the space has decomposition problem. Okay, then the next thing is the fibering theorem. Which you fibering. So fibering means the following thing. Let me just explain it for one space at a time, which would make it, of course, uh, work for a metric family. Suppose you have a, and let me also be very, I mean, not introduce some new vocabulary, so let me just say, suppose it's Lipschitz. Suppose you have a Lipschitz map from X to Y, okay? And suppose that for, such that for all R, F, or maybe I should say, sorry, for all bounded, subset of Y, the collection of F of Z has finite as a 
f d t then x ah yes n plus y has f of t then x has of t or maybe for in order to be more related to what I'm going to use later suppose that for all r if you take the family where you're allowed to let y vary inside y then x has FTT. So the way to prove that is very easy. So what you do is the following thing. First of all, you decompose y. You use the fact that y has FTC to show that there is a winning strategy, which means that after a number of, of times, a number of steps, you end up with bounded pieces in y, uniformly bounded pieces. So in particular, there are these are subsets of the balls for a given r, depends on the first steps of the, of the game. And then what you do, you just decompose this family of three images to end up the game. So what it amounts to is, it amounts to concat concatenating, if you want, uh, the, the, mm, the decomposition tree by adding um, uh, decomposition trees of the three images of the balls of radius R for at, at every leaf. Okay, so you just add a, a tree at every leaf corresponding to the, to the decomposition uh, strategies uh, for the, what is called, what are called the well, the, the pre images of balls. Okay, so this is easy. This is easy, and as a direct corollary, we have that FTC is stable under extension for finitely generated groups, if you want, or for countable groups. Okay, so this is the first thing, let's call it A. The second property is um, union theorem, or union, uh, well, we call it union theorem, union theorem. So union theorem is the following thing, suppose There exists X is a union, not finite union, just a union of subsets, XI. Okay? And for every R, you assume that there exists Y of R, a subset of X, with the following property, such that if you remove Y of R, then what you see is now the Xi's, which, which were not necessarily disjoint originally, if you remove Y of R, they become R disjoint. Okay? Which means that now the distance between Xi minus Y of R and Xj minus Y of R is at most R. Okay? Then, if the collection of Xi and has FTT and Y of R has FTC for every R, for every given R, then this implies that X has FTC. And this is again very easy, but you just decompose it as a union of uh, Y of R, so the given N, uh, the family XI. The union of the xi's minus y of r. So in one step of decomposition, you are then you have to just use the fact that these things have FTC, y of r and the collection of xi. So these are essentially trivial, as you can see. You have similar statements 
for finite entity dimension, but they are much more difficult to prove. Whereas here, it's completely obvious. So um, a nice corollary of that is stability under amalgamated products. So I'm going to try to explain that. Oh, this is not very good. Uh, I should put some more water in it. So corollary is stability of FTC under amalgamated products. By which I mean the following thing. Suppose G is the amalga amalgamated product of G1 with G2 over some H. If G1 and G2 have FDC, then so does G. So it's actually a corollary of both statements, both the fibering uh, statement, the fi fibering uh, property or theorem, and the union theorem. Why is it so? Well, because the way you prove it is by using the Basser tree. So idea of the proof is the following thing. So you know the Basser tree is, is constructed in the following way. So you have cosets of G, one, which are related to cosets of G2, so cosets, uh, or maybe we can take for one of them just the trivial cosets, but then these are cosets. Or let me, let me first do the following thing. So these are cosets of G1, left coset, and these are cosets of G2. So, and here you have cosets of H. And so on. Okay, here is the the Basser tree. Okay, so how do we do that? So first of all, so the, the group G acts um, on this on this um, on this tree. Uh, it has two orbits, uh, one which is uh, corresponding to the coset G1 and one which corresponds to the uh, coset uh, G2. So it has two uh, vertex orbits. Um, and so the point is that by the fibering theorem it's enough to prove that a core stabilizer of this action is uh, that core stabilizers of this action have FTC. What is a core stabilizer? A core stabilizer is just the stabilizer of a ball of radius R in the tree. So first, for, for instance, you can take the base to be this one, to be V0, and you take, um, so it is enough to show by the fibering theorem that the R stabilizer um, R stabilizers have FTC. So I'm going to do it orally. So the R stabilizers again are uh, the number of elements uh, in G which uh, map this V0 at distance at most r from v0. So here, let's do it for r equals 3. So for r equals so let me first do it for r equals 0. If r equals 0, the stabilizer is simply the stabilizer of the vertex. And the stabilizer of the vertex is, in this case, uh, g1. But g1 is, by definition, is, uh, by, by assumption, has FTC. So we are done for r equals 0. Then we are going to do it by induction. So how do we do it? Well, we assume that the, um, the R stabilizer, R minus one stabilizer has FTC. And we are going to, um, to remove some, um, sorry. Yeah, R stabilizer has FTC. So by induction on R, which belongs to 
So let's, let's do it for r equals 3. So suppose that for r equals 2, we know that the 2 stabilizer has FTC. So what do we have to do? Well, we are given um, a new... Um, so we, we just take um, some... I should change r. So given some new r, I'm going to consider y of r to be... Um, the R neighborhood of the R minus one stabilizer in G. And so what is it on this picture? If I see if R equals three and so R minus one equals two my R minus 2 stabilizer will be all elements mapping this to these things here. Okay, this will be my R minus 1 stabilizer. But now, if I take the R, this big R neighborhood, what I'm going to do, I'm going to add this, a portion, a green portion, Here is what I'm going to add. I'm going to add something. The point is that being an R neighborhood of my R minus 1 stabilizer, because R is given, this big R is fixed, and because the R minus 1 stabilizer has FTC, it implies that the R neighborhood also has FTC because it's quasi asymmetric. So it's just a, a neighborhood, it's just a, a, I mean a, a neighborhood of the, of the R minus 1 stabilizer. So it's okay. It also has FTC. Now, the point is that. What I'm, what I'm left with are these cosets, all of the branches of the trees, but now the branches of the trees are very far away from each other. Because in order to, if I remove this uh, R neighborhood of the R minus 1 stabilizer, in order to travel from a point here to a point here, I need to cross this green area. And when crossing this green area, I'm actually ha I actually have to travel at least large R, big R. So what happens now is that if I remove g minus uh, y of r, this is um, an r disjoint union of subsets of uh, cosets. In this case, these are the square ones, so of g1. So I can use the union theorem, because I know that G1, or in this case it's G1, and it could have been G2, because, uh, because I, cho I chose R to be, uh, to be odd. But if it could have been even, it could have been G2. Okay, so you see the idea really that you remove somehow, you, you do it by induction, and you remove a, a neighborhood which forces what's left to be, to be disjoint. So how much time do I have? Minus four minutes. Oh wow, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that I was so slow. So yeah, so it's unfortunate. So I cannot. Okay, so I don't have time to to prove for linear groups. So I yes, I have to stop here. I'd like to thank you. And Thank you. ordinary.
uh, the, to compare it to something is that you know about the space or well I mean in some cases for instance for if you take a solvable group um, somehow the fact that you can concatenate these strategies uh, and the fact that you know how many you need for instance for an abelian group uh, either it is finitely generated or it's not then you know it's the omega so you can give a you can give an upper bound if you want you can you can produce an upper bound depending on what you know about the group for instance for elementary aminable groups uh, we know I mean depending on on the ordinal which is associated with the elementary aminable group you know you can give you can compare it with the ordinal that you have here but except for that we don't know because we don't even know if not all the groups which are in which have FCC are live in D omega for instance which is maybe very unlikely and by the way I wanted to give an example so the example I'm just going to write it down so the example which is uh, uh, oh no this is not going to work so I'm just taking advantage of your question for writing it so if you just take a solvable group with a very with a very with a very big length like for instance you iterate the risk product construction and so on this thing I mean we cannot we can only prove that it, it is in D uh, I mean uh, an ordinal which corresponds to the number of, uh, of extension uh, by uh, by Z every time so and we are expecting somehow the the, mm, the ordinal to be exactly this number but there is I mean we have no method whatsoever to prove uh, a lower bound the point is that proving a lower bound already for finite simple gamma is a non-trivial thing and here we are dealing with infinite uh, I mean with things which are <laughs> Where you cannot use no topology or nothing that you know, uh, at least uh, we don't know how to do that. So, yeah. Also, there is a huge class of groups for which we are expecting a finite, simpli finite uh, composition and the complexity to hold, but we don't know. I mean, uh, a large class of aminable groups that was like, for instance, in. in including a uh, Grigor Suk group or stuff like that. We, we think they have it, but we don't know how to prove it at this point. For Thompson group, we expect it to not satisfy the... but we don't know how to prove it either. <laughs> well, so this is really the, the most uh, non-trivial thing that I know. Otherwise, I mean, uh, you have um, everything that you can, of course, obtain using this... Uh, this um, permanence property, among which you also have the direct union. Uh, so, and using the building blocks, which are, for instance, hyperbolic groups. I mean, all things that have finite asymptotic dimension. So, hyperbolic groups are cases of this. No, otherwise, I don't know. I mean, the f the really the linear groups was the main uh, goal of this, and uh, this is also the only non-trivial, really non-trivial uh, case that we have at hand at this point. Okay, so this is something I also wanted to say, so thank you very much. I was gone. So uh, the point is that the only obstruction that we know for FCC is negation of property A. We know that FCC implies property A. So if you have an expander, or if you don't, if you don't have property A, now there are examples of groups which don't have expander, but don't have property A, uh, then you don't have FCC. But these are the only things, the only groups that we know that don't have FCC. It could be that FCC is equivalent to property A, but I mean, let's go with it. Property A, by the way, is not known for Thompson groups, so it's not a contradiction with our expectation. 